a lot fewer people here today than there were on Monday. wonder why. <laughs> I do have your scantrons here for afterwards if people would like to <clears throat> come and pick them up. This is the textbook that we would have used if we were talking about lambda all term, um, but we're not. So um, if you want to learn more, there's a whole bunch more in here. And this is also lambda 2 as opposed to lambda 1. So there have been a number of books that have been written on this subject <coughs> since then. But you know, since practically nobody's here, I don't really need to talk about the midterm, right? No. So <coughs> really briefly, for those of you who have not had my courses in the past, the high score was 47, which means I'm almost approaching what I'm looking for. I really would like the high score to be 50. Um, so we're getting pretty close. Um, unfortunately, that score was a bit of an outlier. So uh, I will probably end up normalizing to something around 44-ish for these tests. Um, and that way you can just sort of go through and, and do some calculations as far as that's concerned. I did want to talk about a couple of questions. And these are the ones that many people missed, which probably means that I did a bad job of explaining it in the first place. So the first ones of these was having to do with the RF or replicative form. And in retrospect, that's probably just that terminology was confusing for people, what the replicative form was for phi x174. True for all of these microviruses, the single-stranded DNA viruses. The big deal here is that the, the replicative form is the double-stranded form, because that's what you need in order to make more single strands and also in order to make any kind of messenger RNA. So how you make the replicative form is you have all cellular proteins. So pri A, pri B, pri C, that's all parts of the primosome, DNA B and DNA C, which are also cellular replication initiation proteins, and then the DNA primase. And also there's another question about what is, or sorry, I should say, what is an optimal, what's the, the template for which enzyme is appropriate for phi x174, and that was also the DNA primase. So it's no DNA, no viral proteins are required here, and maybe also the question was a little funkily worded as well. So my apologies for that, but the RF DNA, the one down here, um, that's all made by cellular proteins. And that's, of course, is what gets less and less common, the larger genomes that we get and the more different enzymes we have. Um, why is the Q-beta structure that we talked about, the first one in class, incorrect? And that was because um, we talked about the icosahedral symmetry. And so the original structures for all of these were based on icosahedral symmetry because that's the only thing that the software could deal with. And as soon as you impose icosahedral symmetry on something which is not symmetric, then you'll lose any asymmetries. And that's, in fact, even the structure which we have down here. And so it was the icosahedral averaging which lost the presence of the maturation protein in Q-beta and, for that matter, MS2 as well. So I probably should have asked, were there questions about the RF for about this one? Yeah. Well, this one I was confused between that answer and uh, the question we are mm -hmm. um, Because the structure when it came out was lacking it. Ah, the right. structure was lacking it, but the virions were not. Okay. So nitpicky detail, I agree. <laughs> OK, other questions on, on this one? And again, you're. You're not alone, and <laughs> these are the ones, again, that, that lots of people missed, and I think I didn't do a particularly good job of explaining. This one was actually, I think, the most interesting one, and I spent a long time thinking about what the correct answer for this was. When I wrote up the exam, I, I don't have the, you know, all the answers necessarily correct, so I had to think a lot about this. And so the question was, if you have basically a genome which has less secondary structure than it normally would, would you expect to see more virus, less virus, the same amount of virus, or no virus whatsoever? And as we talked about a little bit, we also had the clicker question. <clears throat> the lysis protein mostly seems to be dependent on the distance away from the termination codon from the coat. So the secondary structure here doesn't seem to be a big deal. On the other hand, production of the replicase protein is really important that you have secondary structure. And so with less secondary structure, you're going to have more replicase protein. 
If you have more replicase protein, that's eventually going to shut down production of the coat protein. Because that's what happens with the replicase protein, that's how you shut things down regulatory-wise. And so with that regulation, you shut down production of the coat protein, you have less coat protein, but more replication protein, you have more rat maturation protein. The real question is how much lysis protein you get. And we could probably argue about this, but <laughs> I think that the, the best answer would be that you actually end up with less virus being produced because you have less of the coat protein. You'd have way too much replicase, you'd have way too much of your maturation protein, but you would um, definitely have less of the coat protein. You definitely have to have a lot of the coat protein in order to make enough. Does that make sense in terms of the explanation? It does require a pretty deep understanding of how these things replicate. Okay, so <clears throat> let's talk about lambda. Um, phage lambda, again, you know, got whole books written on phage lambda. It's a double-stranded DNA phage, again, bacterial virus. Some people call it the pinata of paradigms. I think that's the title, actually, or subtitle of the chapter in the textbook. A lot of what we know about gene regulation comes from the study of lambda, and it turns out to be incredibly widely useful and Hopefully we'll have some time at the end to go over at least a couple of little things from this, um, I think rather nice DVD, which goes through some of the aspects of Lambda. And this, as you can hopefully see, maybe at least in the front, um, will be on two hour reserve in the library um, after this lecture. So that should be available as well. Again, big story here is really all about transcriptional regulation and pretty much kind of all different aspects of transcriptional regulation. Yes, it's bacteria, yes, they're bacterial viruses, but a lot of the same kind of ideas turn out to be relevant for pretty much all organisms. The other thing which is really different about lambda as far as all the other viruses that we've talked about so far is its ability to become a lysogen, um, which is where the virus sticks itself into the genome and just hangs out. And what this means is when there's a virus infection, there has to be a decision whether the virus is going to reproduce lytically or if it's going to hang out in the genome and wait. And that's the lysogeny process. And so we'll talk about that as well. And a lot of that has to do with the integration process, which is how the viral genome gets into the host genome. And by the way, just as an, a reminder, this figure I should have put down here um, is from Viral Zone, um, not from our textbook, uh, which is also a nice outline of the various different aspects of the virus. A couple key concepts here, again, things that we've not yet talked about. Anti-termination, um, a lot of the transcriptional regulation in lambda has to do with anti-termination, and that's termination of transcription. So ter transcription terminates normally in the absence of any kind of modification from the virus. With these modifications, then the RNA polymerase stops terminating in a particular place, and you end up with a much longer transcript. The um, whole idea of feedback loops is that you have expression of one protein that leads to the regulation of that same protein. And so we'll talk more about that as well. Lysogeny I mentioned already, the genetic switch, you know, either replicating lytically or replicating in a lysogeny state, and then this process of integration. So as usual, we'll talk about where it came from, a little bit of the structure, binding and entry. Most of this stuff we're going to go over really quickly because relatively boring. Um, and then the, the big deal is really the transcription in terms of lytic growth, lysogenic growth, and the choice between these two. And we'll talk a little bit about replication and release at the end as well. Um, this is a rather nice TM of the virions themselves um, with these long tails. And then this one's a little hard to see down here at the bottom. Maybe I'll turn the lights down a bit. Um, this is a pretty classic, I don't know, this is about as far as they go down. Um, yeah, not much better. Uh, those, that's a really classic plaque assay, but a plaque assay, in fact, of a, a rather interesting mutant, and we'll talk about some of those mutants uh, a little bit later on as well. So where does lambda come from? Um, this is one of those oopsie moments in science. Um, people had been working on a particular strain of E. coli for probably upwards of 30 years, and then one day they happened to put it in a situation where all of a sudden the 
E. coli culture started to lice, which was really bizarre. Like, wait a minute. Where were these, where, and they were actually were interested in looking at other viruses and how those other viruses were affecting that E. coli, and their negative control was like, wait a minute. We've got virus already in our E. coli. And that <clears throat> turned out to be because people were using slightly different strains of E. coli, and E. coli that had lambda that had already been inserted in their genome, and those that didn't. Um, once they found these new strains of E. coli that didn't have lambda, they could do pretty classic one-step growth curves, get uh, 100 to 200 birth size. Um, and then the whole idea was that this is what we call a temperate phage. And probably the vast majority of bacterial viruses have at least a possibility of replicating this way. And this makes a lot of sense if you're dependent on a host and there aren't that many hosts around. So you probably want to persist in the environment. One really good way to persist in the environment is to hang out. And again, in the case of Lambda, it hung out in people's labs for 30 years before they discovered it. And so the whole idea here is that you have the viral genome, which is maintained in the host genome. And this can actually be directly integrated, or in some cases for some of these temperate viruses, just the genome replicates with the viral genome. It doesn't replicate it, it doesn't, excuse me, integrate at all and just is maintained over time. And the real key to being able to replicate in this state as an integrated virus in the genome is at some point you have to be able to make virions. And so this induction case. So you've gone from just hanging out to actually start making virus. And this is a little different than a lot of the human viruses and some of the mammalian viruses, we're just going to bud off of the cell. These guys really just have two ways to go. You either lice or you hang out, and there's no budding process that's going on there. Uh, most of the time, actually, at least for lambda, under lab growth conditions, you do undergo this lysis process. It's only under particular conditions where you undergo lysogeny. And a couple of things in terms of terminology that I want to mention here. A virus that can do this and hang out is called a temperate virus. In this case, the bacterial virus is a temperate phage. So sometimes it lyses, sometimes it doesn't. The E. coli that's infected here that has the virus genome in it, this is a lysogen because it can lyse later. And this, a lot of people get a little confused on this terminology. So. Lambda itself, the virus is not a lysogen. At least the, the, it's only when it's in an E. coli that has that genome, then it's a lysogen. I just think about this in terms of the, the root. You know, gen can generate lysis, lysogen. And so it's the E. coli that has that genome in it, which is a lysogen. Is that clear to people? OK, so <clears throat> no, no, yeah, this is that, that process, sorry. So what is in this lambda genome? Um, lambda genome. About 50,000 base pairs, so slightly larger than the T7 genome that we talked about before the midterm. It's also set up in different chunks, um, like is true with T7, where you've got early, middle, and late genes. But this one is different because it circularizes as soon as it gets inside the cell. So with T7, just that linear piece, you know, first pieces that come in, those are the first pieces that get transcribed and translated, et cetera. Here, that genome circularizes immediately once it gets inside the cell. Um, and that circularization happens through these ends, um, labeled here as COS, so COS at one end and COS over here at the other end. Those are cohesive ends. Um, they're actually 12 bases, um, which are going to be compatible cohesive ends, i.e. they can base pair with each other. And so that 12 base pairs single-stranded when it comes in, the very other end of the genome is 12 base pairs. Those will link together, and you form a circular genome. Um, that circular genome can then integrate into the host. It turns out that the integration is actually not where those cohesive ends are. Um, and <clears throat> that was work that was done by Alan Campbell. Um, who was a real leader, I think. Is he one of the authors on this text? Um, no, actually not. But 
uh, has really done a huge amount of work on understanding lambda integrase, but also he was the one who is credited with discovering the cohesive ends of lambda. Um, really very supportive, um, supported some of my work um, as well, unfortunately passed away about four years ago now. Uh, but again, the whole idea of these gene blocks, uh, gene blocks, again, not surprisingly, these are our early genes, our late genes, and just to make it confusing, they also call them immediate early and early genes. But early genes are going to be your regulatory ones, important for making more of the virus genome, and the late genes are going to be your structural genes. And so here they are, here are our structural genes, head and tail and tail fiber, and then we also have our lysis genes over here. They may look like they're a long way apart, but of course, since they're circular, they're going to be right next to each other. Um, and those are made together. The earlier genes are the ones which are here, um, important for regulation and replication, and then another set of genes which are important for this recombination process. Um, this at P site, um, we'll come back and see a little bit later on, that's the place where you have the actual integration that takes place um, later on in the genome. What's the structure look like? Um, T equals seven head, but of course it's asymmetric because it's got a tail hanging off of <clears throat> one of those five-fold axes of symmetry. Um, this tail is a little different compared to almost all other tails. Um, instead of being helical, it's literally just rings of protein um, that are around the outside of it. And it's a very flexible tail. And flexible tails, this is one of the things, I didn't talk about it too much before, but the ICTV, um, when they talk about classification of viruses, particularly classification of bacteriophages, you've got uh, what we call the contractile tails. That's what you have in bacteriophage T4. You remember it contracts and then make this sort of syringe action in order to introduce the genome. Um, and then you have those with flexible tails and those are what you see here for lambda. But then you also have the ones with the really, really short tails, like T7, the potoviruses. And so those are sort of the three big classes of what people call tailed bacteriophage. So contractile tails, flexible tails, and then T7 with those very short tails, the, the potoviruses. Uh, one thing that's not in your textbook, and you'll see that I've added down here as well, are these tail fibers. Um, turns out that the lambda that practically everybody works with and you see all the EM pictures for is a mutant. It's lacking the tail fibers. Uh, and uh, the tail fiber genes, as you may have noticed when we looked at the genome, those are there. And it turns out that most people were just working with mutants for, for years and years. So these guys, just like all viruses, have receptors. Um, the particular receptor for lambda is called LAMB because it was originally discovered because it was the lambda binding. And so you make a mutation in it, lambda can't bind there anymore. It tells you that people were studying lambda before they were studying E. coli metabolism because it didn't evolve to bind to a bacteriophage. Uh, it is normally involved in transporting maltose, um, maltose through the membrane. And what that means is, and this is something that I actually forgot when I was trying to grow lambda in our lab, is it means you have to put maltose in your media. Because if you don't put maltose in your media, the E. coli don't make the maltose transporter. And if you don't make the maltose transporter, your E. coli can't get infected by your lambda. So grow your E. coli with maltose if you want to grow them, um, grow lambda on them. Um, so the virus receptor, again, it's a transporter for these different proteins. So first I want to talk about the majority of the time which is when lambda undergoes lytic growth. And this is, again, not unlike what we've talked about for all of the bacteria phage so far. Um, first thing that happens, the genome comes inside the cell, it circularizes. And then you have expression of these immediate early genes. Um, immediate early genes, these are going to be transcribed from these two promoters, PL and PR, left and right. Again ridiculously uh, creative naming process here. So going to the left, going to the right. So these are promoters for the bacterial DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Uh, e lambda does not code its own 
RNA polymerase, so it's all dependent on cellular polymerase and then regulation of the cellular polymerase. Uh, and what those transcripts are, they make the N protein and the CRO protein. Um, and these are the immediate proteins which are made, also known as the immediate early proteins. The N protein is an anti-terminator, an anti-terminator in terms of transcription. So this anti-terminator here of N will block the termination that would normally happen at this termination point and at this termination point, um, TR1 and TL1. Both of these have binding sites in their RNA for the N protein, also known as N utilization sites or NUT sites. So NUT L, NUT R, N binds to these sites, and if we have a chance in the video, and if not, later on you can take a look at it. After it's bound to the RNA, that will bring other proteins to the RNA polymerase, which will modify it in such a way that it will now read through or anti-terminate at this particular position, and you end up with a much longer messenger RNA, which will then be translated into all of these other proteins. The last of those here is the Q protein. The Q protein is also an anti-terminator, and this is the anti-terminator that's important for the late genes. So over here at Q, there's a promoter that makes us a really short RNA in the absence of Q, but when you get Q, you make all of these other <clears throat> RNAs. So this then, particularly after making Q, this will make you know, the A protein, et cetera. But most important is where you start to make these late proteins, which are all of these head, tail, tail fiber, lysis proteins, et cetera. So as soon as you have Q, you're going to start making all of those late proteins, which is going to lead to lysis. So pretty straightforward process. Infection, circularization, make N. And ND terminates, and you start to make <clears throat> um, eventually Q, and that will give you the rest of your rest of your lytic cycle. So that's happening over on this side here. On the other hand, you can also have lysogenic growth. So lysogenic growth is this you know, whole idea that you hang out in the genome. Why would you want to hang out in the genome if there aren't very many hosts around? So if, you're, if you lice and all these virions go out, they're looking for more new hosts. If the host that you're in is not growing terribly well, that means there probably aren't a bunch of other hosts around, which would be a good place to go and lice and make more of your virions. So if growth conditions are not good, it's to the virus's best interest to wait around basically until the going gets better. And the way that that works is there's a protein called the lambda repressor, also known as C1. Anybody have any idea why C1 would be called C1? And I forgot my list, so I can't put anybody on the spot. So you absolutely require C1 for lysogenic growth. What happens if you don't have something that you need for lysogenic growth? What kind of growth are you going to have? Lytic growth. So lytic growth all the time. What that means is if you look at plaques that are formed, remember our plaque assays, if they can undergo lysogeny, if you look at a plaque, what you will see is in the middle of the plaque, they're going to be cells that are unhappy. Why are they unhappy? Because they're making virus. So those cells, the lysogens, are actually going to grow. And so what you form is something called a turbid plaque. And that turbid plaque means that you've got the lambda lysogens, i.e. the E. coli that have the lambda gene on them, growing in the middle of that plaque. If you don't have C1, what kind of plaques do you have? Clear plaques, exactly. So the C1 is the clear plaque phenotype. Lacking C1, 
never go through lysogeny. And that's, that was identified again by the geneticists. They found mutants in lambda that only lysed. And turns out that there were three different genes, and we'll talk about the other two um, in just a second. But lambda C1 um, and was originally described as the repressor. Now, what happens, what does Stedman mean when he puts quotes around things? It's not, well, it's not the only thing that it does. So it turns out that lambda repressor is great at blocking lytic growth. So that's what it does. It's a repressor of lytic growth. But what it also does is it stimulates transcription of its own messenger RNA and then protein. So lambda repressor is a repressor of some genes, and particularly the PL genes here, which are going to lead to making of crow, but most importantly making of Q. No Q, no lysis. Um, and then stimulating production of its own gene. Um, the way that this works is there are actually three binding sites right here. Um, different operators. Operator 1, operator 2, and operator 3. Turns out that they overlap both PR and PL. We're just going to look at one of them right now to start with. So the rightward promoter. So OR1, OR2, and OR3. <clears throat> Here, the lambda repressor, or lambda C1, I should say, binds really well to OR1 and OR2, but not very well at all to OR3. And OR3 is where you have this promoter for C1, also known as the promoter for repressor maintenance. So that's what the PRM here is, repressor maintenance, which is confusing because it's not the P right. But you know, PRM is promoter, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Repressor maintenance. These guys are blocking again what's happening at PR and stimulating this. Once you get enough of lambda C1, it turns out that it will also bind to the operator 3, both L and R, and completely shut down expression of everything. So you don't just keep making this. If you have a positive feedback loop, end up, the whole cell would end up being filled with lambda repressor. Um, so that's how you have the case of lysogenic growth. But the next thing that happens is you've got lysogenic growth. You've got lambda C1 that shut everything down. At some point, you've got to be able to escape. When the going actually starts to get good or really, really bad, then you want a way of getting your virus genome, and particularly your virions, out to infect other cells. How does that work? It's all about C1 again. So if you, the going gets bad, and the way that we know about the going get ba getting bad, excuse me, for lambda is particularly UV irradiation. So putting your, lam sorry, your lambda lysogens, your E. coli, under UV irradiation, you start to get a bunch of DNA damage. Once you have that DNA damage, that's sensed by the cell saying, oh, I need to repair all of this DNA damage. And the virus is kind of listening in, going, hmm, no, there's a bunch of DNA damage. My DNA is in this genome. I want to get the heck out of here before my DNA gets damaged. And so that seems to be the process. Um, the regular process, also the save our souls response, um, is usually DNA repair. So this is what happens normally in E. coli. Um, that's repressed by this protein called LEX-A. But LEX-A then gets broken down where you have lots of DNA damage. LEX-A is repressed, is gotten rid of, and then the SOS response happens. Cell growth slows, you repair your DNA, and then everything is happy, except if you're a lambda lysogen, because then C1 also gets cleaved, because it looks a lot like REC-A, uh, sorry, LEX-A, and as soon as lambda C1 is cleaved, then it doesn't bind to DNA anymore, it doesn't shut down the PR promoter, the cellular polymerase will get on PR and make all of your lysis genes. So that's how you get induction. The question, of course, is how does the cell know whether it wants to go lytic or whether it wants to go lysogenic right after infection? And so that's the process called the genetic switch. And the genetic switch here <clears throat> has to do with lambda C1, but then the other one of those immediate early proteins, 
that we talked about. So actually we didn't talk about it at all. We talked about N, right? N's anti-terminator. What was the other one? CRO. What the heck does CRO stand for? Control of repressor and other genes. Again, horrible naming procedure. But um, known as <clears throat> the control of repressor and other genes. And basically, I like to think about Crow as sort of being the, the anti-C1, also a DNA binding protein. But Crow itself is not a activator. It's actually really a repressor and just a repressor. And it binds to the same sites as the lambda quote unquote repressor does, only in opposite affinity. So it binds really well to OR3 and OR2 and not very well to OR1. And so if it binds here, you're stopping the production of the C1 messenger RNA because this promoter for repressor maintenance can't get made because Lambda Crow is sitting down here. On the other hand, PR, which is going to make all of those lytic genes, is available and you can make all the lytic genes. So there's going to be this balance between Crow and C1, which is going to determine whether you have lytic growth or lysogenic growth. So then, of course, the question is, we're looking at these Russian dolls, okay, what determines whether you have more Crow or more C1? So that gets to the other Cs, C2 and C3. So what happens if you make mutations in C2 or C3? I'll give you one guess. Clear plaques, exactly. And what does that mean? That they're really important for <laughs> making your lysogeny. So, Turns out that the real key to this is the C2 protein. C2 is now a pure transcriptional activator, as opposed to Pro, which is a repressor, and C1, which is both. So C2 will make the original amount of C1. So you remember PRM? PRM is repressor maintenance. So once you have lambda C1, then you can make more lambda C1. But how do you get lambda C1 in the first place? The cell is not making lambda C1 right as the genome comes inside the cell. So if you have C2, C2 will stimulate transcription from this promoter, which is the promoter for repressor establishment. And so it makes C1. Also, it will make the integrase protein and this, pro, this sorry, transcript called PAQ. So what the heck is PAQ? P-anti-Q. So this is an antisense RNA. The Q transcript, particularly that Q transcript which is made before it gets anti-terminated. If you make now a transcript which will base pair to that, you end up with double-stranded RNA. That gets degraded. You're never going to make any more of that particular RNA. So you, if you've got enough C2, you turn on C1, you turn on integrase, and you turn off Q. Happy? Everybody happy here? So if you've got C2, why doesn't the cell go lysogenic all the time? Turns out that C2 is very unstable. Um, if there's no stabilization that happens to C2, then it doesn't have enough time to make C1 and go through the lysogenic cycle. And I give you one guess, or you can read it on the screen, uh, what's important for stabilizing C2? Got one of them left. C3, exactly. So the other one of those mutants. And C3 somehow, and this is actually still a pretty open question, senses how well the cell is growing. And if the cell is growing very well, there's not very much C3 that's made. And so therefore you don't get C2, you don't get lysogeny. However, if the cell has problems, um, mostly because it's just not growing very well, there's not too many nutrients around, which of course the virus knows means there aren't any more E. coli that they can go infect. So that leads to production of C3. And then that will stabilize C2, and you end up going down the whole 
this genic pathway. Yes, no, hmm, confused. Um, <coughs> there's you know, one other thing to mention here. So C2GUM also gets into the integrase gene. Um, integrase is a site specific recombinase, and we'll talk about that integration um, here in just a second. Um, just as a reminder, again, C1 is originally going to be produced from the production of the promoter from repressor establishment, again, regulated by C2. But once it's being made, then it gets maintained. And that's the repressor maintenance, again, because C1 leads to production of C1. One of the other nice things about, well, nice things, again, speaking about from the lambda's point of view, uh, once you have C1 in the cell, if there's another lambda that tries to infect, what happens to that lambda? There's a bunch of C1 around. So it's going to stop production of C1, or so stop production of the virus going through the lytic cycle at all. So once you're infected by lambda, and once you've gone into that lysogenic state, you're completely protected from any what we call super infection. That's why you get turbid plaques, because those plaques are loaded with virus. And if you didn't have some way of protecting yourself, then there's no way you'd have any of that growth. Again, the growth of the lysogens in the middle of your plaque. And that's just because of the production of C1. So that's that resistance to superinfection. So what is, what's integration? Um, integration is taking the viral green genome here in brown and integrating it into the host genome in black. And again, this is most of the work of um, Alan Campbell. There is that viral integrase gene. Again, it's being made by the C2 protein, which is that transcriptional activator. Again, only if it's stabilized by C3. If you make the integrase protein, that integrase protein will take the lambda genome and pair it. So there's that at P site that I mentioned. It's actually right next to the integrase gene. Um, this actually matches exactly to a sequence in the host genome known as the at B or the attachment site in the bacteria. Lambda integrase will bind to this and in the presence of some host proteins, and this is a host protein also discovered because of lambda called the integration host factor, IHF, um, which will bend the DNA and allow these two to integrate and that integration process means that you have your bacterial genome binds here. You have integration of the whole viral genome here, and then the rest of your host genome over here. Again, once you have expression of integrase, integration host factor, you have integration. But then at some point, again, if you've got UV damage, something's going really wrong with the cell, this needs to get back out. Then there's a protein called excisionase. And that excisionase, together with integrase and IHF, can allow the genome to come back out. Not surprisingly, excisionase is only made during that lytic cycle. And what I didn't talk about, but the genes that encode both excisionase and the integrase are part of that leftward transcript. Usually that gets <clears throat> degraded, the integrase gets degraded under lytic growth. Um, but if you're going into lysogenic growth, again, you're making a specific transcript for that integrase gene and just the integrase gene. If you make integrase and excisionase, it's always going to come out. And once you have your genome come out, then you're going to be going through the lytic cycle. So this is transcription, regulation, integration. What else do we need to do? make more of our genome. So how does that happen? There's the O protein, the origin binding protein, or the origin of replication. Turns out that the origin of replication is also overlapping where the O gene is. Um, lambda does not have its own DNA polymerase either. So part of all of these regulatory processes are using all of the cellular processes in terms of making genome, making more of its messenger RNA, so origin binding protein, you get DNA B, which is one of those proteins that's really critical for getting initiation of replication. 
DNA B is particularly the DNA helicase, so it's, it's what pulls apart the strands and allows the primase to come and bind there. And that early replication is what's called theta replication. So this is what we talked about in molecular last term. You've got one origin, bidirectional replication, goes all the way around the genome. Again, these are circular genomes. And then, of course, you have a topoisomerase to separate from each other. This happens for about 10 rounds. And then what happens is there's a switch. And that switch is then to late replication. And there are virus proteins that are involved that we're not going to get into. I think there's like two chapters in here about how that happens. Uh, and then you switch over to going to rolling circle replication. And rolling circle replication, we kind of talked about before. We talked about 5.174. Um, here you have, instead of a bidirectional replication fork, you just have a single replication fork. And what happens is you end up making many, many copies of your genome. And the polymerase just goes around and around and around. And you end up with this really long, first actually single-stranded DNA. But then the cellular polymerases will do lagging strand synthesis and fill that in. So you end up with many copies of your genome all hooked up end to end to end. Again, these concatomers, um, which you also see in, in T7. Um, and there's a, we won't take a look at this, but there's a nice animation looking at this here that I, I put the link in um, to your notes. So once you have genome, now what do you need to do? You need to put virions together. A lot of this work was done by, I'm sorry, it's a little hard to see here. Um, Roger Hendricks um, here was <clears throat> one of the real leaders in terms of understanding lambda assembly. Uh, his PhD advisor was the person that Nacho mentioned as Francis Crick's buddy. Anybody remember who Francis Crick's buddy was? That was one of the questions that I didn't put on the midterm. Who was Francis Crick's buddy? Watson, exactly. So, um, and I love that Nacho didn't want to say his name. I think that's awesome. Um, so, <laughs> but yeah, so um, Roger Hendricks's PhD advisor was Francis Crick's buddy. Um, so <clears throat> how you make these structures, you have a prohead, which is made through scaffolding proteins. So there are scaffolding proteins. Again, they're not listed in the genome, but it's a classic internal scaffolding that happens. You also have to have some cellular chaperones that are needed to make this structure. And the reason that these bacterial chaperones were found in the first place is if you made mutations in them, lambda couldn't grow. So grow EL, grow ES, the reasons they're called grow EL and grow ES is not because they're important for folding proteins, it's because they're important for lambda growth. Which is, of course, the, the obvious reason that you should name things, right? Because it's all about lambda, like lamb B. You know, who cares about maltose transport? We care about it being the lambda receptor. So um, you do need these chaperones as well as scaffolds to make the prohead. And these proheads are really fascinating. We'll talk, did, um, did we talk about chain mail yet? I'll we'll talk about chain mail later on. This is the cross links that form in structures. Did Nacho talk about that? I'm trying to remember. Um, these are covalent protein cross links. But, what happens is the individual capsid protein subunits are actually linked to each other in these um, circular proteins with extra peptide bonds that form on those side chains. Um, so very, very tough structure. Um, and then once you have a prohead, and just like we had with FIX174, that prohead then gets its genome packaged into it. And remember, these genomes are now concatomers, right? So they've got a whole bunch of genomes all hooked up right next to each other. In those concatomers, you have cross sites. Again, not surprisingly, those are the things that at the end of the genome, that's where they link together when you come inside the cell. Those cross sites are really good binding sites for a protein called terminase. And terminase will bind to a cross site and actually cut this cross site, leaving those 12 base pair cohesive ends. It will then find the end, that one five-fold axis of the prohead, and package the G DNA into that. This requires actually a whole bunch of ATP hydrolysis and really crams the DNA into the head. And the fact that it's really crammed into the head basically means as soon as you make a little hole in the head, which is what happens when you have the infection process, the DNA just comes spilling out. And so it's that ATP hydrolysis of packing the DNA which gives you the metastability that as soon as you have a hole, that can be released. 
Um, that goes in, and then as soon as you get a whole genome that's been packaged, you're going to get to the next cost site. Then the terminase will bind to that cost site, and it will go off and find another prohead, package another genome as well. Once you have a packaged head, then you attach this tail protein. And this tail protein is really fascinating how it gets put together. As I said, it's not helical. It's just a whole stack of rings. Um, the height of that stack of rings is dependent on a protein called the tape measure protein. I'm not going to talk about it. It's actually the lambda H protein. But that tape measure protein, if it's shorter, just in terms of the number of amino acids, your tail is shorter. If it's longer, the tail is longer. And that's um, a lot of the work, again, that, that Roger Hendricks um, did um, during both his PhD work and then continuing um, along behind that. So now we have our infectious, hopefully, virions inside the cell. How do they get out? Um, they have the lysis proteins. What are those lysis proteins? There are really three of those. Um, there's a transglycosidase. Um, transglycosidases, you know, they're all aces, and so what do they do? They're enzymes. They chop stuff up. Um, Translycosylase are chopping up different parts of the membrane. There's an endopeptidase, which also will chew up the peptidoglycan. So I should say the translycosidase is from the chewing up the glycan part of the peptidoglycan. The endopeptidase is chewing up the peptide part of the endoglycan. And we'll take a look at that in the video in just a second here. How does this get to where the peptidoglycan is? There's a holin protein. And a hole in protein does exactly like what it says. It makes a hole in the inner membrane so that these enzymes can get through, break down the peptidoglycan. Once the peptidoglycan is broken down, then the cell can't hold itself together anymore. It lyses, and all of the virions come out. A lot of the work that was done on lambda was in, you know, sort of mid late 60s. And um, some of the illustrations, I, I, I can't show it here, but people can come take a look at this later, um, are pretty psychedelic in terms of how they interpreted all of the different um, proteins. And this actually sort of has people hanging on a washing line, which was supposed to be the lambda genome. And one of the <clears throat> main researchers on lambda at the time was spelled by the name of Ira Hershkowitz, who made these amazing pictures of um, I actually have a whole full-size poster, which gets into all of the different parts. But this is the main gene control circuitry here, where the first protein that's made, these Ns, these are the, the immediate early proteins, N and CRO. So the N protein, which is that anti-terminator, can lead to production of C3, C, and C2. If you have CRO around, it will block C1 and also eventually block itself, because um, it's just serving as a repressor. C1 will block CRO and turn on more C1. How do you control C1, C2, and C3? If you just end up with Q, you end up with all of your late genes. So um, if you want to understand the <coughs> regulatory processes in terms of that genetic switch, it's all right here. And hopefully kind of sort of makes sense. So talk about all these things already. Um, we've got about 15, 20 minutes. Um, I wanted to just quickly go through the DVD here. Um, we can take a look at some of the different uh, parts of that. Um, particularly important, I think, is the release process. And the, the animation there is a lot of fun. But you will also see, uh, get a bit of an idea anyway how the, or what timing, I should say, um, these were, this particular DVD was made. I think it was 2003 it came out, but there are some references to some even older things in there that you may or may not pick up. Let's see. The take home messages here are basically sort of everything that we've talked about already. Um, there are a few things that I did want to mention about the DVD, however, and the main one is that it gets into lots of details about which a lot of the individual proteins, particularly in the assembly of lambda do, don't bother about what the H protein does, the I protein, the Z protein, the X protein, all of these other things are concerned with. 
I would say in terms of thinking about proteins, just concentrate on the ones that are the ones that we've talked about um, so far today. Mea culpa. Um, I thought that I could get this to work. Hopefully, whatever player you can find <laughs> for the Lambda DVD will help. Um, if people would like their scantrons from the exam, I'll put them up up here. Um, and next time I won't try and be so fancy as far as whatever my extra stuff is concerned here.